So, welcome guys to the first German Tech Open Lecture after we haven't been doing open lectures for a few years now. So I'm really, really happy to have real people again uh, in front of me. It's been a while. I hope this will stay a while. And it's also the first time we do it in this uh, location. So a big thank you goes to Michael and his team from Stiftung Bildung Werte Leben, who will host us here tonight. Thank you very much. So for those of you who don't know what German Tech is doing, German Tech is a <coughs> company and we're offering services along the value chain of innovation. We're doing company building, we're doing a lot of trainings around the topic of innovations. How can we help establish companies to act and think more like startups? And the value chain of innovation starts with education. So that's why we also offering educational formats such as this one tonight, the open lecture, the World Changes in Tech open lecture, where we invite entrepreneurs like Nico today um, to tell us a bit about their story. Because um, what we learned along the way of our activities is that entrepreneurship has a lot to do with, in, with uh, um, inspiration. So people need to be inspired to come have ideas to develop um, companies to really start building startups to get to be empowered and that's also why we are filming this uh, it will be available from YouTube that's also why we like to do it in English because we know that our crowd is not only German speaking um, so if there's anything that you won't understand we can also translate but main language is English so today we're here with Nico um, and he will introduce himself um, and tell us a lot about him and then we'll also have uh, uh, time for questions. Um, I met Nico a few months ago, so we were introduced by Laura here um, at an event of the American, the German-American conference. The German, German American, uh, conference. Um, and uh, it is a good story for me to see that we're not only meeting entrepreneurs and people who can inspire us on typical startup events so that it is i encourage everybody to go to all kind of events to talk to all kind of people because i think we would have never met otherwise um and it wasn't like in a startup environment and now <laughs> exactly i remember that <laughs> see it was different than here tonight um so yeah i'm very happy that we met uh, and I'm curious to hear what you got to tell us. And I'm quite sure that we will learn a lot about energy um, and that we can discuss how we can solve the crisis. That's what he says now. Let's talk later. So give it up for Nico. Thank you. First of all, thanks for coming. Uh, this is actually the first time I'm speaking in quite a while. I used to do this one, well, more often when I was a founder. Um, I'm saying when I was a founder because at the moment I wouldn't necessarily consider myself as a founder because the company that I'm helping to run at the moment already has existed for 25 years roughly. Um, so yeah, my name is Nico, I'm originally from the north of Germany, from Kiel, which is also where I actually went back this year after being away about 12 years, uh, going to university in Switzerland and working abroad and working in Germany, and, but always in big cities, and now I'm back in this fairly small local capital of the northernmost state of North Germany. And um, so the reason that we're here right now is that I would, yes, I would talk about what it means to go back to the roots, so-called, but um, mainly to go back to a Mittelstands company, which I guess everybody knows what that means. Um, and coming from both a, a tech background or a tech education probably, and also a consulting background, and it's quite it's obvious that those are quite different worlds. Um, that was I was aware of that, but um, I think now I'm in for more than half a year. And it's quite interesting to see the first learnings of what's difficult, what's, what's what are the advantages of being in such a company, what are the, the drawbacks. And I won't be doing a monologue for 45 minutes, but we'll have a discussion, well, a conversation, also with you. So I would like to invite you anytime there are questions. Um, just raise your hand quickly. Uh, the other thing that I'll try and give a very quick rundown of is not our entire energy system and how it works and why you're going to pay double for your electricity next month, but um, 
basically how solar works and how we use solar in Germany and um, what are the biggest challenges at the moment of deploying it quick enough so that we can actually have the so-called Energiewende. All right, uh, before we do that, I'm going to tell you a quick story about this guy. This is Sachin Taka. Sachin Taka is from Sri Lanka and he's been applying, well, he applied to our company about four months ago um, from Sri Lanka. He lives in Sri Lanka. He installs solar panels, that's his job, he's an electrician. Uh, and he happens to install the systems, the very exact systems that we also use. So the same brand, um, the same brand of inverter, which is the electrical component that um, turns the energy from direct current into alternating current, so you can actually push it into the grid. And as a craftsman company, it's always important that, well, your biggest challenge when you hire or onboard new people is always that they have to learn what you're doing. They have to learn your processes, but they also have to learn the products. So theoretically, Sachin Taka would be the perfect hire. And then I thought, well, that's really cool that you're hi applying from very far away. And we get applications from other countries as well, but um, that was definitely by far the furthest. Uh, on top, most of them don't necessarily have experience. In this case, he has five years of experience. This would be perfect to hire him. Uh, there's even a, so he's from a Drittland, which means he couldn't necessarily get a visa for Germany. But we have a major situation in Germany, which is if we want to achieve our Energiewende, we need about 80,000 installers for solar. Just for solar, we also have wind uh, until 2030. So we need 80,000 more people in jobs installing solar panels. Um, we won't be able to have all these people from within Germany. So we need people from, or even within the EU. So we definitely need people from outside the EU. So there is a program by the Bundesregierung that you can actually apply as a person from this country or from a third, or a third party country. And it takes about six months and then you, so if I would sign a job offer then in about six months he could be here. Um, and it's a major pity that I haven't done that yet. I haven't gave, given them a contract yet because we have uh, an issue at the moment in Germany. So at the moment, I can't offer him a contract because I don't know if I'm going to have enough material that we can install next year. And that's actually the major drawback. And there, you may have read this in the news, um, although the news mostly at the moment is about rising prices. Um, of course, we all know that there's um, a shortage of microchips. Uh, there's not a shortage of the, the modules. And I'm going to talk quickly about what a, what a solar power plant basically is, but there's no shortage in most of the parts, but in some of them, very important ones, um, they use a lot of microchips. And for that reason, we are at the moment really in a battle, literally every week of trying to find enough products so that we know that we can install over the next quarter, the next two quarters. And basically when we look at what the challenges are for us as a, as a, as a society, when we want to go um, net zero, uh, we need enough wind, we need enough solar. At the moment we have a lot of wind in the north of Germany, we have a lot of solar in the south of Germany, and we use the electricity all over the place of course. Wind produces way more power per square meter of, of an installed um, uh, power plant, but we also need to transport it so we have the grids in between. Um, what we as a company do is we install solar panels and solar power plants on residential homes, so on houses for, for um, usually one family, but also on uh, small and medium business. Uh, so small plants, um, often also logistics centers and stuff like that, or even schools, churches, etc. Um, yes, going into this, so, so demand, we need those three elements in order to, to get to net zero rate. We have a lot of demand. Uh, solar is profitable. It's use. It's really it makes sense immediately to install a system because you will save money immediately. You have an upfront cost, but you can get government loans, for example, um, that are secure, have secure interest rates. So it's a very safe investment. Um, we have talent? Question mark. I mean, we have people that apply from from outside outside even the EU. We have craftsmen in the EU. We have craftsmen in Germany, and it is becoming a more and more interesting job for uh, for of craftsmen because they can actually be part of something useful and and also in, in craftsmanship we can we at least experience that this is something that they find good what well, we don't have is supply so material is definitely by far the issue um, so here on the left side uh, you see SMA SMA is that product that we actually use by far uh, it's a German company they're the biggest the world's biggest inverter company um, so inverters again a very important part of, of the of the system 
and they were in 2012 probably yeah they were uh, making about three to five something between three and five billion in revenue uh, with a very stable profit margin they had to have well they had a very hard 10 years basically after that they barely survived a lot of other german solar companies went bankrupt in the last 10 years and so we had basically had a, a massive issue when it comes to supply here at home um, solar world is another case solar world is a company that many people know from uh, the news mostly because it was a massive well a darling basically of the media back then uh, it was a german uh, solar company they were in, they were producing solar uh, cells in Germany. They went bankrupt finally three years ago. So we had a big industry with over 100,000 people working in this industry, installing solar panels, but also producing solar panels, producing inverters, producing batteries. Most of those jobs went somewhere else, mostly to Asia. And the main reason probably is not actually the, the, the government that had that shut down the subsidies, but it's also, of course, that it's cheaper to produce somewhere else than in Germany. But of course, we also had a government at the time that shut down most of the subsidies. And when you look at this on the left side, um, you can see that 2010, 2011, we installed, this chart only goes until 2019. At the moment this year, we've probably reached the point of 2010. So we've reached the point of installing capacity at, per year, which is the, the black line. So we're back at where we were 2010, but it took us 10 years basically to get back there because the subsidies back then were cut and they were cut so massively that the industry basically faltered within two years. And you can see that uh, the, red, the red line or the red uh, charts are uh, the total capacity that was installed in Germany. So that slowed down quite a bit between 2012 and 2018. And now it's actually picking up again. And now we have, of course, because of obvious, for obvious reasons, um, we have massive plans of, of uh, getting solar really into the, into the, well, onto the buildings, onto, also onto fields, um, even onto parking, parking lots and, and so on. Um, the same thing goes for the investments. So on the right side, you can see the total amount of euros invested in solar. Um, so most people would think, well, this must have just been going up the whole time because it makes so much sense. And solar is by far the cheapest way of producing electricity, uh, but it hasn't. That's actually not the case. So we had this massive peak ten years ago, and then also our company, uh, where I'm working today, uh, we downsized by th three times. So we were three times bigger than we are today, uh, and now we're going back there. But that was the same case for SMA, for example. SMA uh, went down to below one one billion in revenues from those nearly four billion, and it's very hard for the industry to really get back up to speed, um, which they are doing right now. But then, of course, on top, we have this, this major supply chain issue um, and a talent issue, potentially. Um, this is not very important. This is interesting. Um, but we have, as you can see, Bavaria has by far the most solar installed. Um, but Baden-Württemberg is the second one, uh, mainly because they were incentivizing uh, back in 2010, 2012. They were incentivizing a lot, which is good. Um, we have. The sunniest states are actually in the east, so it would make sense to install more solar in the east. <laughs> um, very quickly, what is the solar system? It has four main components. It has an inverter, that's the thing on the left. The inverter, again, it, it changes the energy from direct current to alternating current. This is the, the, the one thing that we're not um, being able to procure at the moment. So at the moment, sometimes even we're buying those inverters in Poland, we're buying them in Romania because um, the companies have, well, they have basically stocks per year that they send allocations that they send to countries, and then the German allocation is completely empty, but we are actually, we're able to find a few inverters in Poland. We're still paying 50, 60 percent more than we should be paying for them, um, which is not ideal, which also means the end of the, the customer, our customer in the end, uh, is paying more. There are massive supplies supposed to be coming from China next year. Uh, but supposed to be, which because by now we don't even trust our suppliers, which are typically large companies in Germany, large logistics companies in Germany, or, or resellers basically. Uh, we don't trust them until we have the, uh, the, the material in stock. Because we've had so many situations where we had builds starting and we are supposed to get a truck delivering everything and it's just we get a call instead of the truck and saying, ah, sorry, we can't deliver. Um, 
well, yeah, the panel is pretty simple. Uh, it's silicone uh, panel is not going to be an issue. We have so much Chinese production power uh, and production capacity ramping up the whole time that um, prices have always been falling. So there's an interesting thing with solar panels, which is the exact same thing with um, processors for computers. Processors for computers double in capacity every two years, Moore's law. The same thing happens with the price of for solar in inverse, in inverse relationships. So it, um, the price is always halved every two years, roughly. And so far, this has always been the case. The battery, um, battery is there to store, of course, electricity because we produce most electricity during the day with the solar system, but we actually consume it in the morning or in the evening. So we need to somehow uh, store the energy for about 24 hours, or actually less than 24 hours to properly use the system. And then the, the rack system, the rack system is an aluminum system that we use to install the solar uh, either on uh, a saddle roof or on a flat roof. The panels always need to have an angle to the sun. So if you just put them flat on, on, the, on the roof, that actually wouldn't be very good. It's about 40 degrees. Um, you could also install them on a wall. It's less efficient, but it's still quite efficient, especially in winter because the sun's uh, quite low. So those are the four components. Um, inverters are the ones that are halting us, essentially. They're halting the industry from installing more. They're halting me from um, getting more people uh, on, on board for next year. If I would just go on and say, well, we have, if I would just look at our order book, basically, our order book would say we could be five to seven times bigger than we are today in one year as, as per revenue as a company. That's our inbound that we are getting at the moment. We're not, we're doing zero marketing. We have actually put up barriers for customers in order to be able to, to kind of uh, uh, give, send us a request. Um, but that's great. It's just a very um, hurtful situation when you realize that you can't take all those orders. Be well, you can take them, but you also have to tell the customers, I don't know if I'm going to be able to deliver the product, and I don't know when, um, which is not, not the great situation. Most customers understand this, and they have a lot of um, well, uh, patience, but it, it's also very hard because we, of course, tip, pay salaries every month, and we don't really know um, how much we can grow. So basically, this is actually not a stock picture. I know it looks like a stock picture. <laughs> this is um, installing solar panels in, in Schleswig-Holstein, uh, which sounds like a wonderful thing to do. Now, background of my, myself, again, consulting and, um, and tech. Uh, this company has been around for 25 years. At the moment, there are about 20 employees. Um, there have been way more in the past. And we're on a growth trajectory. We decided that we want to grow again. Most of those installing companies, so 80% of solar systems in Germany are installed by three to five person companies. Basically, you're a local electrician who also told, taught, taught themselves how to do this. It's not extremely hard. Um, the hard part is probably, like any business, coming up with processes, coming up with scalability, coming up with um, rules kind of so that you can have more than two or three teams but actually are able to, to achieve a certain, a certain speed. Um, I would say the most important thing, the most important learning for me at the moment um, when it comes to what is the drawback of joining a Mittelstands company <laughs> is there's a lot of paper. <laughs> there's so much paper. <laughs> Basically, um, and it, this is unimaginable for me because when, I, when we were setting up a startup uh, before that, um, when you have to do your, your bookkeeping, you have to do your taxes, you have to do payroll and so on. For everything, like for every single thing, there's a, there's a solution. There's some SaaS tool that you're going to pay nine euros per employee per month, and it does everything for you, which is wonderful. Uh, this company has none of that, so everything is actually there's a paper sheet per employee. Every employee fills out the paper sheet and hands it in at the end of the month and someone is giving it to um, the, the tax accountant. And these processes have, are like this. And I, I, in the beginning, I was completely, um, well, yeah, s speechless, basically, because I, I couldn't believe that this is still the case. Uh, and I started asking friends who, ha who are working in companies like that. And I realized, well, actually, probably the majority of, of Mittelstands companies run like this. They don't use uh, Personio and so on. So that's a major part. Um, paper is very, uh, in a way, it doesn't make it better if it's digital, but it makes it more scalable. So we're probably still going to use the same amount of time to serve a customer, 
But for example, I think this is one of the best examples what we started to do. So what I introduced in the very beginning was how we would get a customer in the beginning was well, when I came, uh, either a phone call or an email. Um, people would Google Solar Kiel or Solar Schleswig-Holstein. They would find our company, they would email us or they would call. Uh, if they call, they would get the answer, please send us an email. So, um, but even this conversation often, depending on the employee, would take 10 minutes because they're starting to explain something about the system, they have questions and so on. Meanwhile, that employee is supposed to actually be writing offers. Um, now, they email us, but the email information is completely unstructured. They, they will send a picture of their house. They will send some information about why they want a solar system. They're, they've seen something on their neighbor's roof or they're afraid of this and that. Everything is unstructured, so, and this is the case for every one of those small solar installation companies or any other appliance installation, heat pumps, etc. Most of these companies run like that. There's really the, the exception that I would say at starting at 10, well, 10, 15, 20 employees where companies start to structure more. Um, anyways, then someone needs to read that email and needs to put all of this information into our uh, CRM system. and probably has to call them five times because they need to ask about how much electricity do they actually consume? Um, how many square meters does the roof have? What's the size of the roof tiles? Because we actually need that in order to plan the, plan the system. So it's a very slow process of getting all the information that we need in order to send them an offer. Uh, I then developed a very simple, basically a type form questionnaire where they actually have to answer about 40 questions. They have to upload pictures. So they have to do quite a bit of things in order to get into our system. So it takes about 15 minutes. But by now we've had, um, I think, I launched it in August and we have had about 300 people fill out that form. Um, so it's 300 different projects that we could potentially build. And one project typically takes us, well, it takes a team about one week. One team is two people. Um, and a typical project is running at the moment at about 30,000 euros. That's the typical price for a, uh, for a one family house. Um, again, we don't have the capacity to do that, but then also at least now the customer is doing the work of giving us all this information. So they can't even uh, send us a request if they don't tell us all the information that we need in order to give them, a, give them an offer. Um, this information now goes into an Airtable, basically Excel, um, but it works like a, like a, so I have, we have a database of our customers now that we can query, well not our customers, our, our, the people that are interested in buying from us. And this is completely normal for any startup in Berlin. This is nothing special. It's basically, I don't know, it's the, the very basic level of, of uh, doing a, a sales funnel. Well, in uh, an SMB company, it's actually quite an innovation. So for, for them, it saves a lot of time. And so that's, for example, one of the upsides that I've seen. I've seen that you can actually achieve quite a bit of, pros or of, of um, progress with fairly standard tools, even free in this case. I mean, so far, we haven't started paying for them. I think, at the, I know that, <laughs> I've told them that we're going to have to pay for this at some point. Uh, and it's, that's probably the second point. Um, so when it comes to what are more pain points, also this is, this is another system that we've installed. This is on a, on a local business. Um, there's a massive mindset shift that you need to give into, well, that you need to create in, in a company that has always been doing the same for 20 years. Um, and that has never had the need to change processes. Um, one of those things, for example, is, um, and, and this is very, it's, it's, it's surprising to me how much we argue about it, but it's whether you're buying a license for software and you pay it one time versus you're paying a recurring fee every month. For me, it's completely normal to pay a recurring fee every month for software. I find that sensible because it reduces my um, upfront investment, but of course I am paying this fee for eternity. So whether it's Microsoft Office or the entire Microsoft system, which we run our emails on and so on, uh, which we didn't in the beginning, <laughs> uh, or whether it's Airtable or Typeform or Notion or, or one of those tools that we, that in startup land, everybody knows them, everybody's used to them. Uh, whereas in the Mittelstand, that's not very normal that you're paying subscription fees. Um, so that's something that I've had to deal with quite a bit. Uh, of course, there are other things. There are things like goal setting coming from, um, from, from tech, you're, complete, you're used to, for example, OKRs. So you would set your OKRs, you would go in and every 90 days you, you review them with your team, having a waterfall system and so on. Whereas in um, Mittelstand's companies, it, it, you're lucky if every employee is getting a one-year review of, of their performance and 
setting a goal for something that they want to achieve next year and so on. And that's not even, I mean, it's understandable if maybe every, not every craftsman has a, a goal for next year, but even a person that is, in, is planning the systems or is selling them, um, this is not something that you would see. So goal setting is something that you need to build up. Culture is something that you need to build up. Um, typical Handwerker culture is rather, I wouldn't even say it's rough on the edges because they're very kind persons. They're super um, cool guys that are mostly very committed to their job and also very, very committed um, to a good work-life balance, something that I think um, I was lacking definitely before. Uh, which doesn't mean that I have a better work-life balance now, by the way. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting there, but I still, I, once it's ingrained into you, I still end up sitting in the office until 9 or 10 p.m. Not every day, but it happens. Um, but those are the, the main points. And I think before I keep talking forever, maybe we change this into a conversation a little bit, if, you're, if you don't mind. <laughs> Wait a minute, the switch on the... <laughs> um, so that's maybe, maybe the quick rundown. Um, I haven't told you that. Sorry, I haven't told you that much about the company. So it's called At Fontes, which means uh, to the source. Um, they've been around for 25 years. Um, as I said, it's an EPC, which means uh, it means. Uh, see now, I don't even know. Well, it's, it's in installers. Uh, it's when you engineer, procure, and construct the systems. Um, perfect. Wonderful. So main, main, main focus is solar uh, residential. Uh, about 30% of uh, the projects that we do are, are solar for SMBs. At the moment, we look at SMBs quite a bit because their electricity prices have gone up way more than the electricity prices for residential. So your bill is probably going to be double next year, maybe a little bit more. So when you've been paying probably 30, uh, 30 cents per kilowatt hour, you're going to pay 60 cents next year. Um, the bill for a typical Edeka or Rewe or so on, if they don't have an agreement, some of them do, if they don't have an agreement with an energy provider, some of them even have their own energy providers, so they have basically come up with agreements so that maybe 100 Rewe's would go together and would start buying energy, um, or any other energy consuming company, and this could be a print shop, this could be a bakery, we've heard the, the bakery case in the news. Uh, for, for them, the energy prices are going up fivefold. At, at, the, at the minimum. Uh, and of course, this is killing companies. Um, so we actually said, well, probably if we're trying to serve the interest of, uh, well, the public interest, we should probably start actually tell the, the private consumers, look, guys, we, you have to wait because it's more important that we start installing systems on the, um, on the company roofs because we get a lot of requests from companies as well. So that's the quick rundown, basically. And now we can go into a conversation if you like. I have so many questions, and I'm sure you also have. So it's not only me asking questions, but I will start. Um, can you describe a little bit the process? I mean, you, you told us what, about the, the differences between startups and now being in the more mm -hmm. traditional company. How do you remember the moment when you decided to do this? Or was it like an... Uh, yes, I do, the, actually. Did you wake <coughs> up in the morning and were like, okay, I'm leaving my capitalistic life and <laughs> going somewhere else? Well, I definitely didn't leave my capitalistic <laughs> life behind. <laughs> um, okay. Maybe that's the biggest difference is actually I'm now at a company that makes a profit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're in startup land. Most of those companies out there are actually not profitable. True. Um, however, so maybe first question first. Uh, did I do this overnight? Did I decide overnight, yes, I'm now going to go and go away from the big city, go into the small city, uh, go into a structure that I knew beforehand was probably a bit old-fashioned, I would say. Um, no, it was not overnight. It was definitely something that... So my last job that I did before this was actually uh, working for a sailor, Boris Herrmann, who was um, known because he sailed Greta Thunberg to New York. Um, and then he's a, sailor, a racing sailor, basically, and I was running his, um, his entire business side, so everything that was to do with sponsors, that was to do with uh, projects that we would want, want to develop. Fairly big seven-figure budget per year. Um, very interesting job, very, very different job. Uh, I took it because I love sailing, and I thought, well, he's the, the, the slogan is climate action now. 
um, I decided to leave it again because I didn't see enough impact. And I would say uh, that was my hope, and I would say also say that was definitely the approved approved hope that. Uh, I can see now every day, every week, basically, where we've installed so much solar power, and I can exactly count, measure how much uh, electricity will be produced renewably like, mm. from that moment on, uh, so I can measure my impact. It's actually, if you think about it, it's very much a startup or a, a tech mm. thing that you want to measure everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in this sense, in that old job, I, there was no impact measurable, basically. Uh, it was mostly marketing for the big sponsor companies. Versus and, and in consulting, of course, we would try to measure everything, but uh, the, I left consulting quite uh, astonished about how little you actually add in value to, um, to the company because A, the things that, you've, that they've paid a lot of money for that uh, you came up with are often not implemented. And then B, in most cases, um, it's really still a shareholder economy and not a stakeholder economy. So it's still about making more profit. And those companies that have the money to pay for consulting are, well, they're DAX 30 companies. They're, they're big, 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 big multinational companies, most of which are struggling a lot to become green. Uh, and then they pay Boris Hamann, a sailor, a lot of money and say, now I'm green because I'm paying the sailor who is saving the world. Yeah. <laughs> um, so th that kind of cynicism maybe in inside me uh, made me change jobs again. Uh, the new government that we have in Germany now for a year, um, which in, yeah, now one year basically, they've done, they've had to do quite a bit, huh? <laughs> they've had to deal with quite a bit in one year. Um, that change meant that we would of course see a push with the Greens in the, uh, in the government, we would see a push for renewables again. And having, having known the company from growing up, I knew that I liked energy as a topic, always. Mm -hmm. I, I liked energy when I was in consulting in general. It's something that um, everybody needs. Before the company that we were building, that I was building was an um, insurance company. Uh, and so an insurance startup was a startup that I tried to build for health insurance. Uh, and that was the same thing there. I liked that it's something that everybody needs. Everybody needs to have a health insurance company. Everybody needs to have electricity. Mm. Uh, electricity is a bit more important nowadays than your health insurance. But actually, they're, they're both up there. Um, and. So I knew I wanted to go out, out of one job. I knew that it was probably going to get even more uh, push for demand when it comes to solar. And I also found it to be a fairly useful thing to, to get this company that we have as a family company and uh, take it a bit to the next level, kind of. And so I had started to have discussions within, within the family if, if this is something that we can imagine, if this is something that we would also see that we want to go into the same direction. Because, of course, coming from a world where um, 10x everything is kind of the norm. Um, and a, a typical company, there's a saying in, in, in what I've learned by now in Mittelstand, basically, that if a company is trying to grow more than 60% per year, it's, it's going to falter, it's going to fall apart. Uh, now, I just told you that if we actually just serve demand, we would grow 500%, 600%, 700%, <coughs> um, which is nearly the 10x that we usually always talk about in startup. Um, so it was not overnight, it was a process for sure, but it, um, I reflected mostly on the, the, with the question whether, uh, can, can, I, can, I, can I really see the, the, the purpose of it? And that was here, so if you want to say very, very standard uh, business talk is 3P, right? You have people, plan, profit. <laughs> And I would say uh, the, the people, planet, profit uh, triangle is perfectly aligned here because uh, well, we create more jobs. Uh, we are definitely helping the planet by what we're doing. And we actually are in a race against time. We need to do this as quickly as possible. Um, and we do turn a profit. So you decided this before the war on Ukraine started, right? Yes. Um, and obviously, 24th of February, the data we will all remember for the rest of our lives. Um, it changed your industry again, and it changed even your expectations on the politics that started last year when new government came in. Did you ever regret your decision? No, no, not definitely not for the reason of the war. Um, there are probably other other things where I would sometimes say, "Well, this is 
I'm not regretting it, but I, I, I knew that there were challenges, there would be challenges, and uh, the challenges are there. They, they, yes, they exist, <laughs> which are mostly to do with the paper. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, interesting. It's not a war, it's a paper. <laughs> um, no, it really is. It's, it's also, and I don't even think that it's the German way of doing business, because if, yes, we have a very complicated way of doing our taxes and so on, but it's, we have solutions for that nowadays. Um, the war changed, the war changed positive pressure into stress. So there was a positive pressure that already before the war, people wanted these systems because mm -hmm. even at 30 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, it makes a lot of sense to install a solar system on your roof because you're going to save a lot of money over time. Um, the war then probably tripled that demand or quadrupled that demand, especially in, in, the, early, uh, in the early weeks of the war, so February, March, uh, when we then started to analyze how much um, people emailed us and called us to get systems that nearly and we had the same. We saw the same over over the industry. Um, we were sometimes. Well, I wasn't there yet, but uh, they were sometimes switching off the phone because you couldn't work because the phone was just ringing the whole time. You would you'd try and think about outsourcing the phone. Um, so it was a überforderung situation, kind of, uh, where uh, people are so under pressure from. And it's a positive pressure because ten years ago was a situation where the, these companies were not making money anymore because it wasn't profitable anymore to install a system at the time um, and now it's all inversed and this is something that not very many industries have to go through mm -hmm. that you see this up and down up and down um, and it, I'm quite surprised how many of the, um, the yeah, they're basically the founders of these kinds of types of companies that we have and, and again 80% of the com uh, 80 percent of the systems are installed by companies that are not even half the size of ours so they're three to five people so then we have about 20 people uh, which is probably another 10%. And then you have very big companies like, uh, well, if you, if you read the news about uh, solar, it's, there's Enpal, which is a big, a big installer startup. There's Solar here from Berlin, a big installer startup. Um, Zonen is a big company from Bavaria. But these are, these are actually installing the, the very, very minority at the moment still of, of systems. Um, but for all of these other companies and for their founders, this is a very stressful time. Most of them are saying, I want to stop. This is too much. I don't want this anymore which is quite interesting. Because as a business person, you both say, but why? It's growth, it's great. <laughs> what do you wish for um, from politics uh -huh. to support us? Let's go to this one slide about politics. That's in the end somewhere. Um, politics. <laughs> <laughs> of course, as a, as a good consultant, I have my backup slides. <laughs> <laughs> um, so solar politics, uh, we have well, basically I prepared three slides. Uh, what I wish for from politics, um, I wish for them to use their mind and not to listen to lobbyists too much. Mm -hmm. And I think at the moment they're doing quite a good job. Who, who is lobbying for what? Um, the fossil fuel industry is lobbying for using the fossil fuels. Um, or using it as long as they can somehow drag this out. <laughs> <And> <laughs> because of course we have, a, today we have there's a good argument for having to use the fossil fuels until the end of shelf life of a, of a coal plant, so of a gas plant. We have some gas plants that are one year old, they're brand new. Of course, we need to use this gas plant that costs us a, hundred, a few hundred million, one well, last, but out of LBE, for example, a few hundred million. Um, or otherwise, they will, make, they will lose a lot of money, um, which in the end, they're going to ask the government to reimburse, like they did with the nuclear power stations. Um, so, yes, we need to use this, the, the fossil fuel as much as they still exist. Basically, we need to use them until the end of time and until the end of the lifetime of a, of a, of a uh, power plant, especially nuclear, for example. Um, we, have, we still have three nuclear power plants, we should probably use them. Um, in coal, that's a different story because coal is by far the dirtiest of the ways of producing energy. Um, but. Well, because we now started talking about it, we start with the argument, which is also the most complicated. The ugly is yet, yes, at the moment, there is talk about, well, there's talk about an energy Strompreisbremse, uh, so that your electricity is basically capped, which is, <coughs> would be a very bad thing if that uh, was just a cap, uh, as it is in France, for example. France, electricity prices are more than double. Ours are high at the moment on the stock, on, there's a stock exchange for, for electricity. Uh, our prices are high, the French prices are two to four times as much. 
because one of the reasons is the nuclear power plants are not running because the rivers are too low. Over the summer, the rivers didn't uh, carry enough water, so they couldn't cool the nuclear power stations. Um, the other is that they don't get replacement parts because we have a supply chain issue. Um, but also, France capped prices for power. So the price is capped, I don't know at what, but this means that you are not incentivized to save because it doesn't matter. Um, so yes, we want to be incentivized to save electricity, of course, so we, we shouldn't cap uh, the price. Um, what this wonderful chart here means on the right is that you can see the renewable costs are on the very left of the chart. Renewables are by far the cheapest way of producing electricity, period, which is wonderful. Uh, yes, we still have the old, um, the, the, all of that capital invested into old power plants and somehow we need to still use them until they're, they're done. Uh, what the new proposal basically now is to say that every type of produce, production of electricity should be able to make the same amount of profit. So if I pay five cents for, per kilowatt hour to produce one kilowatt hour of energy per kilowatt hour to produce uh, electricity, um, I am able, I'm allowed 10% or 15% profit on that. If a gas power plant costs about 25 cents per kilowatt hour, so five times as much, um, they're allowed their 10% profit still. And actually, I don't know the details. I don't know if it's 10%. That would be very unfair if they are allowed 10% of 25 and I'm allowed 10% of 5. Uh, I don't think that's going to be the case. I don't know. There's this, this is not the law yet, but this is what has been leaked from the, from the government. Um, and this would mean that... Wonderful, thanks. This would mean that we are damping the demand for renewables, of course, because as an investor, for example, I'm not in, as interested if I know that the price is capped. Um, I'm not as, because at the moment it's, very, it's even more interesting to invest into solar or wind. Um, especially wind, we need a lot more investment at the moment. Uh, because you can actually make quite a bit of money over the next two, three years. That will of course go down a lot because what, as we install more, um, the efficiency in the market goes up. Um, basically what this would mean, so they call it Zufallsgewinne, uh, is that they want to pay for people's electricity to be cheaper by taking the money from those that are making a lot of money with producing electricity at the moment. As an idea, probably makes sense, um, but you need to, the devil's in the details, so you need to really look at it. And I think this is something if they would um, now protect fossil electricity too much, they need to protect it so that they don't go bankrupt until next year. But they don't need to protect their profits, the mm -hmm. profits that they've been reaping for decades. Um, when it comes to the good, maybe, Next year, starting January, we'll have uh, no more Umsatzsteuer, which I actually don't know what it is in English. Uh, that. That, thanks, yes. So Added the value. VAT for yes. solar... Added um, value something. <laughs> Added value tax, sorry. Um, for solar systems will be cancelled completely. So until now, most people, actually most people that have a big house aren't, weren't paying VAT already because they were becoming <coughs> electricity producers, which meant they were becoming a little company. Um, but now anybody who installs a solar system is not going to pay that. So that's great. That's 20% off. Um, same goes for um, earnings tax on the electricity that you produce. It's going to be zero. Same goes for a lot of the paperwork, a lot of the red tape around installing such a system. Um, and of course, this goes. This list could be c continued by saying that, well, which is, the, there's something that uh, well, there are laws now in most of the states that if you build a new house, you have to put solar on it, especially if it's a, if it's a company or if it's a, a large um, flat, flat complex. So these things are good. Um, they are overdue, of course. Um, and it, it makes solar cheaper. Unfortunately, our prices are going to go up 10% next year, so on January 1st. So that already kills uh, some of that 20% because we pay more for... Um, for what, uh, for what we procure. Interestingly enough, I've seen quite a few companies uh, charge 50 to 80% more than we do for these systems, and they actually get customers. So there are people out there that are so desperate to buy a solar system, they're willing to pay nearly double of what is a, a fair price. Um, that's not great. That's capitalism. That's not great. <laughs> I agree on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, it, because in the end, it is, of course, it, it destroys um, the kind of the social, uh, the, the idea that we, as a society we try to use the capital as efficient as possible. Because in this case, there's someone making a lot of money from, because they could have built two or three systems for that. 
Um, there's another issue that you may have heard about in the news recently, it's called the smart meters. Uh, in the near future, we'll be producing a lot of electricity over the daytime from sun. We'll be producing electricity when the wind blows, which is very unreliable. We don't know when the wind blows. So we'll have a lot of electricity at some point and a lot less at some other point. Um, so we'll have to have an, a net or a grid that's going to be very flexible. Our only grid is not flexible at the moment. What we need to put into all of households, into all electricity consumers, but also producers, are smart meters that are able to uh, turn off or on um, consumption and production. And uh, we're behind on that. <laughs> How much? Uh, years. <laughs> okay, but not decades. No. <laughs> no, but years. Do, do we have enough material of that, or is it also a shortage because of the um, microchips? So I think, no, I think we'll have enough material of that. Our so SMA meters, so we already install smart meters in all of these systems because of, we expect them to be used at some point. Uh, we can already use them in order to uh, service the, the systems uh, remotely. Um, the SMA smart meters are sold out for months. Uh, we found a company that is now white labeling smart meters uh, that imitate the SMA, so the system thinks it's an SMA smart meter. We haven't told SMA. <laughs> it's on YouTube now. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it was actually an SMA engineer who told me that this works. Okay, okay. okay so um, are there any questions from the audience? Anything or sh thoughts that you want to share? Yes, of course. What about people? You mentioned that you need 800, no, 80,000 engineers. No, not engineers, installers, yes. Yeah. yeah. So are they available or how, how do you scale That's, them and them? I can't answer that question on a, on a uh, political level, whereas I don't know if they're available for the whole country. Um, when it comes to Sakhantaka, who I showed you before, he, I had to realize that he actually has competition from, from here, from locally. So we revamped, com we completely revamped our job offerings and made sure that they were searchable mostly on Google, so that you can find our job offerings on Google, which wasn't the case before. So Google has this own thing called Google Jobs, and 80% of job hunts start on Google. Um, so it, you don't need to pay a lot of money for Indeed or Monster or LinkedIn or whatever. You just need, especially not for um, uh, craftsmen. The only money that we pay for it, um, when it comes to recruiting is 50 euros per month for eBay Kleinanzeigen, because we have an eBay Kleinanzeigen ad, because that's where um, craftsmen often write us to, for a job. Um, I don't know about the 80,000. What I know is that it seems as if, because we are getting more applications than people we can hire, that's not because of the people that I told you, not because we don't need them, it's because we don't know if we have enough material for them to install. So I could hire all the people that are applying at the moment which, when it comes to demand that I have, but I can't hire them because I don't know if I have enough supply. Um, I do believe that it's going to be less of an issue than for other industries, uh, for other crafts industries, because of the renewables aspect. So we are seeing that craftsmen are quite interested in saying, I, well, their motivations often, well, I'd like to be able to say I'm doing something useful. So I am seeing quite a bit of uh, uptick in that, which makes me hopeful that probably more and more people are willing to, or are interested in saying, I'd rather install solar panels than um, Put cables, put cables through a, a roof of a new apartment complex or something. Um, mm -hmm. As you know, uh, in the last years, the um, efficiency of the EVs mm -hmm. uh, increased a lot. So I think um, many of the existing plants, the residential and mm -hmm. industrial too, uh, have to replace, to retrofit, to repower, yeah. to increase the capacity. You know. And uh, are you ready to face, uh, to handle this kind of market? Well, we're not, we're not even ready to handle the demand of new installments. Are we ready to handle the, 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 the repowering? That's what this is called? No. I mean, at the moment, we're not able to handle anything. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, there will be the next um, uh, challenges in the next future. So repowering is a very important step. That's definitely correct. Um, Even to recycling the the silicon materials, yeah. because uh, you know yeah. now the PV models they use uh, saltine. Uh, They've changed in technology. Technology. So 
So there's basically there are two points that you're speaking about. There's, there's point one, which is repowering. So uh, a typical PV panel that you buy nowadays has about 500 watts of power that it can output maximum. Um, as a reference, maybe you always, when you turn on your, let's say your um, vacuum cleaner, it always says the watts, right? It's like 1,500, 2,000 probably for a vacuum cleaner. So one of those panels can make 500, so you need f four panels in order to run your vacuum cleaner. Um, the, back 20, 10 years ago, the panels were pro probably producing about half, so same size of panel was producing half the amount of electricity. So yes, they, yes. So they doubled in, in efficiency, basically. Um, well, if they're older, yes, even more. Um, but from 10 years ago, it's about double. So yes, it makes sense to repower, um, probably after about 20 years of, of a lifetime of, of the system. Uh, that will add to demand, yes. Not as much because what's installed, so if you look at the installed capacity that we have so far, um, on the left, the red, the red one, um, we're at seven gigawatts, if I'm right. Uh, no, this is percent, sorry. I actually don't, I have to think about how many gigawatts we have installed in Germany. Um, what we want to try to install in the future, going forward, is 30 gigawatts per year. This year, we, ins we will be installing about six to seven gigawatts. Starting next year, the government would like us to install 30 gigawatts, <laughs> somehow. Um, I don't know how. <laughs> and so maybe another challenge, technology challenge, uh, could be the um, switch, yeah. the switch to off-grid uh, power plant. Uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, you know, with the increasing capacity of the battery and militarization, yeah. um, I mean, uh, solid state battery, um, uh, everybody could be able to storage electricity. Right. And basically, that what would happen then is so this idea is it's a quite communist, commun communist idea, but it's a very interesting idea is that we could, if we all installed solar panels on our houses, we could basically bankrupt the. Um, the big uh, RVEs, Aeon and so on of this world, so the big utility providers. Because, of course, a house that is um, now running on solar is going to pay 80% less money to uh, the utility because for their electricity. Uh, and that's, that's so and so forth. Uh, it could be a communist idea, right? We could kind of create a revolution by all installing solar. Um, however, and, and, this, and this can happen only because those batteries get better because you need to be able to save enough electricity for those cloudy days, the windless days and so on. Uh, and also you have winter and uh, solar panels actually don't work very well in winter. In winter they have about 10% of um, capacity that they have in summer. So that means December to February they're nearly useless. Um, they're not completely useless but they're nearly useless. The better the batteries get, um, the more you get, could be off grid. Uh, I don't believe that that's going to happen. That might happen for very large scale uh, consumers, for example. So if you are um, maybe an aluminum alloy uh, for, um, production plant or some sort of production plant that uses gigawatts of electricity every week, it could potentially make sense that you produce your own electricity and that you start to become off-grid by using solid state batteries. Um, all of this is not going to happen next year. It's going to happen over the next few years. I think the point that was Quite interesting that what you mentioned is uh, recycling. Um, we, of course, have not you dealt with the recycling a lot. Probably it's going to start becoming a business line that we, but then it's not going to be our job to do the recycling. We'll probably, I know that there's been quite a bit of research on recycling. Um, we will probably um, go to the, the project, uninstall the solar panels, ship them off to the recycler, have them recycled, and then we would do the repowering of that plant. Okay. Um, I'm always thinking in terms of um, education. So, mm -hmm. um, are you <coughs> actually invited by schools, school classes, and so on, and, and sharing your technology or entrepreneurship mm -hmm. with with young people in schools? Um, not as far as I know of. Okay. Um, I would have to ask, like, I would have to ask around the company if someone has done this. Um, not recently, certainly. Uh, it, there's one specific aspect that where we have quite a bit of, um, and this was 12, 14 years ago, uh, our company got one of those 
it's called Deutschland Land der Ideen Awards. So back th there was an initiative by the government that where they were giving those awards to innovative ideas. And one of one thing that our company did for a long time was um, Bürger Solaranlagen. So they would um, propose to small communities that they would install a solar system on, for example, a school roof or some other public building in the in the municipality. And everybody who was in that village could participate with, let's say, 5,000 euros, 2,000 euros, so a small amount, so that you could actually ha invest in kind of your local energy project. Um, and in that time, um, so that was 14 years ago, uh, I know that we did that quite a bit. Okay. So that, that back then, every school, of course, was interested in what's happening on the roof. The, the kids would know that something's happening on the roof and so on, so they would invite the company of, to explain it. At the moment, I'm not, not saying. This school here in the backyard mm -hmm. has the big roof to the south side, the full panel. I think it's, a, I don't know how many uh, uh, megawatts, they have solar? Gigawatts, but, but the okay. whole, it's a big solar panel uh, area on the school. And I was in the um, Vorstand at that time. <laughs> and we, we did a, a project with the, with the, uh, young, with the uh, Schüler, the pupils, mm -hmm. uh, students. students. Um, to understand technology, to be encouraged, to do it. it was 10 years ago, actually, or mm -hmm. in 2007, 8. And it was a same big success. Was it was a, yeah, ago. it was a big success. They were all interested, everyone was motivated, and things like that. But um, still, I can't see these roofs supplied in the city. So there's almost no roofs. In no. the city, in, in like Berlin. In Berlin. Yes. This, this is an interesting question. Yeah. There's an interesting, well, what do we do with all those roofs in inner cities? Inner city roofs are smaller per square meter of, of uh, flat of living uh, space below them or working space below them, of course, because you have a lot more st uh, stories in those houses than you would have in a, in a uh, one family house. But of course, it would still make sense. Actually, I did this math just on the weekend with a friend because he asked me, so how much electricity could this typical Berlin house produce compared or in percent compared to uh, a one um, a one family house or a single single family house, and it's actually not that much less. It's so the syst the roof is probably double as big as for the the one the single family house, and that means with a not large enough battery you could come out get thirty to fifty percent of the electricity that that house needs from solar, um, whereas a typical single family house can get eighty percent from solar. Uh, the problem is the regulations. It's extremely difficult to um, regulations. the regulations to automatically bill the, all the, the the people that live in that building with the electricity, and then also basically you have to the building has to be owned by one party. If the building is owned by several parties, like a VEG, it's impossible because one party doesn't agree, and it's already an issue. I don't know how many of you own a flat and those meetings that you have one, once a year where you talk to the other owners of, of, of that building. I actually own a flat in Berlin and I, I, hate, the, I hate it. I hate those meetings. And um, because there's, it's literally in our, in our building, there's 30 parties, you, it's impossible. You're not gonna find consensus. Um, of course, you could mandate this. You could say as a government or as a, as a political rule, we mandate to install those systems, but then we would have to change the way that we build for the electricity so radically, which may happen. Let's see, if the war drags on, maybe, mm -hmm. which it seems. Yeah, I think it is, uh, uh, the, the educational part is a super interesting point because, I mean, I learned so much today. Uh, what obviously it seems to be like, it should be basic knowledge of everybody as we are facing this energy crisis, right? Mm -hmm. So what can we as a society do to make more people be aware of this or what question. what can i as a as a citizen do to support your cause it's a it's quite not a good call question. your office obviously no, i understand def that definitely definitely <laughs> don't call us <laughs> um it's a very good question because it's probably a question i've actually, actually a question i've never asked myself because as you said we, we have so much demand that we, we're um we're happy with that and uh it seems as if yes we will be quicker in installing but it, what's interesting is when you start looking at this goal set by the government. So the, the government sets a goal, says 30 gigawatts per year. Mm. Um, and this year, 30 gigawatts actually wouldn't get us to 100% renewables, it would get us to probably 80% by 2030. We're now at 40. Um, 
And so I don't exactly know because you probably can't go to China and get me more of those I uh, can components. Try. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's the biggest issue at the moment. Mm. Um, but maybe actually, if you think about the fact of this Mieterstrom problem, so most people actually don't live in a single family house. Most people live in a flat um, or they live in a flat or, the, or whether it's a house or a flat, they might not own it, mm -hmm. but they rent it. When you rent something, you're not really allowed to install something on the roof. You have to ask the person that owns the roof. Um, so this is kind of the, the complex, this is where we at the moment always say, stop, we're not going to start even trying to do this because we don't want to, we don't want to be the ones who are then obliged to talk to five different uh, stakeholders suddenly. Uh, and, and then suddenly, at some point during the process, one of them says, ah, no, I don't want it anymore. It's too expensive. It's, I don't like the color. I don't know. And um, th so that could be something. That could be something uh, we're pushing for more, um, well, for less regulations. For res less regulations when it comes to rent, renter provided electricity, uh, solar electricity. Sounds very difficult. I, I have an idea on that, but I, I don't want to. We can we can discuss this, discuss this later. Uh, yeah. One more question. I just read in the newspaper that uh, there's a rising problem that uh, converters or inverters mm -hmm. are being stolen. You know, people are stealing them. Yes. What? Yeah, really. Mm -hmm. So the new generation of inverters sometimes have GPS. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, but we don't get the new ones, so, <laughs> so, we're, so we're selling the old ones. Uh, no, it's, I've heard that as well, mostly on um, those large-scale projects of solar that you wouldn't see on, if you sit in the train and you go from Berlin to Hamburg, uh, you can see a lot of solar on the side of the, of the train. Um, and, of course, these are not always secured. So, yes, people are stealing inverters. <laughs> wow. Um, there's a... Maybe when you think about your question again, what could a person do? What could someone do? It's also, to, of course, save energy. I mean, pretty obvious. Yes, if we save more electricity, we'll have, we'll have more available. Um, we need less gas and so on. We need to, but that, that also, it's not 100% true because we also at the moment are burning gas because we're selling electricity to France mm -hmm. because you can make money with that because France is not very good in getting renewable or going into renewables. Um, if France's nuclear power plants would be working, they would, and I have a lot of friends in France who are very pro-nuclear, and they would say, well, yeah, you with your stupid uh, um, renewable energies, now you're using coal. Uh, now their nuclear power plants are not working at the moment. They probably will be working hopefully again next year because otherwise we have a problem. Um, but at the moment we're using our gas plants in order to make profits to sell electricity to France. Um, which we don't have enough gas, so that's probably not, I mean, I think there's been rules on that now that they've started to turn this off. Um, but yes, of course, saving electricity uh, is something. Uh, one other thing I wanted to say is looking at your household, and this mostly applies to people that have uh, single houses. It's really hard for someone who's living in a flat to, to, for example, change the energy efficiency of your flat because you would have to change the windows. You would have to change the roof of the house you would have to change the flooring and the ceiling. Um, you're not going to do that if you rent a flat. Even if you own a flat, it's actually not that easy because you have to, so you have to go to the other eight people that own a flat in that house. Um, but when it comes to, and we have 15 million um, houses in Germany, so uh, one fa um, single family houses in Germany. Two million of those houses have a solar system at the moment. Um, so we need to somehow install solar systems from 13, more, 13 million more houses. But actually not all of them are uh, capable of taking them because you have four sides of a roof. Uh, the northern side is not useful because of the sun. Um, so you want the southern, the western, or the eastern side. Um, so roughly 75% of 13 million is what we can still install. Uh, but we also need heating. Uh, we have heat pumps that are coming to the market. Heat pumps are basically the, the latest technology for, for installing a, um, your heating system. A lot of people still believe that a heat pump is inefficient or that it won't produce the same amount of hot water as an, uh, a boiler, um, that you basically couldn't use it if you don't have um, your heating in the, f in the floor or the ceiling, so the modern type of heating, the Fußbodenheizung. Um, it's not true, actually. By now, these systems are good enough and they're efficient enough that you can simply install them in an, in an existing house. Yes, you need a little, you need a knowledge, you need the knowledge, so the installer needs the knowledge, and this mm -hmm. is where it comes back to talent and 
Also, heat pumps are compared to inverters. Inverters are fairly easy to get if you keep looking for them in Poland and other countries, um, or if you know your, your supply. Uh, heat pumps have eight to 12 months of waiting time. So they have about double to triple the waiting time at the moment. And we have a capacity to build in, in Germany uh, at the moment 150,000 heat pumps per year. And we want to have a capacity of 600,000 heat pumps per year in 2024 or 25. Um, 600,000 heat pumps, well, we have in total 15 million houses that very, very few of them have heat pumps at the moment. Um, most of them have gas or oil furnaces. So this solar is just one component of energy, well, basi basically of energy efficiency revamping of houses. So we're, we're looking at having to completely overhaul the way we consume energy. And that's going to be very expensive. Okay, are there any more questions? Yes, Laura. Yes. I thought that one uh, solution would be that more people like you go into the uh, middle-style companies, uh -huh. right? but uh, then what was your experience coming, because the title was also right, the yeah. mindset in the middle in, in yeah. Mittelstand, yeah. coming from like fancy Berlin, mm -hmm. startup world, and, mm -hmm. and so on, into this company where people have been working for 20 years mm -hmm. probably also. So, what do you think they appreciated, like from your growth <laughs> mindset coming yeah. in and yeah. visualizing, and what did they absolutely not appreciate you coming in? What was your it's, good, it's quite an interesting question. Um, so maybe the first, the, 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 the basis of the question is, is it, would it be good if more people from the tech world, for example, start joining SMBs? Uh, yes, probably, because in the end, of course, the company will change if there's someone in the company who's willing to push for this change a lot and willing to take a lot of um, passive aggressiveness for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say the, the things that they were appreciative of is definitely culture. So this is something that, we, that, that they can learn a lot from. So a simple thing is as simple as putting a fridge into um, this, our storage, capacity, storage facility, facility so they can just, just like here, grab a, a Bionade or a Fritz Cola and we don't charge them for it. Um, or the fact that we're now introducing the, the job rat, for example. So simple things, pretty simple things. A lot of companies, a lot of bigger companies already do them. Typical, typical for small companies is that their management is just so busy with just running the company that they don't really have time to develop culture. And you can see that employees are quite grateful for this. Mm -hmm. As simple as producing goodie bags with, uh, you know, the typical things with logos on them, cups or uh, notebooks and so on, and, and people find this people find this nice because it, somehow they identify with their company in the end. Um, but of course, also a uh, uh, the the fifty euro voucher per month that you're allowed as a as a uh, abad giver to give to your as an employer to give to your employees, you're allowed to give fifty euros per month uh, as in, in form of a voucher that won't be taxed. So it's a tax. Basically, it's a, it's like near it's like ninety euros of um, a salary increase. And so we started to do this now because it's a selling increase and effectively it's a selling increase where basically because we don't pay, nobody pays paying taxes on it, um, it's much more effective than an actual selling increase. So of course they appreciate that a lot and they appreciate that I take the time of researching these things and then saying, well, we should probably impl implement this because uh, we get more bang for the buck. Uh, I would say the, the thing that I mentioned earlier where we automated the inbound Definitely they were appreciative, but then in the beginning they were already like, why are you spending time building something where we could just answer emails? You could just answer some, you could just hire someone to answer emails. Why are you spending two weeks or three weeks on building this tool that is then letting the customers fill in all the information? So that was like one of the first things where they were, you know, why do something that has, doesn't give me an immediate output, an immediate return? So I think this is a lot of the, mm. the thinking is around let's try and get the stuff done that's right in front of us versus let's invest time and, and, uh, and resources in order to get a, a better outcome in the future. And this mindset is really hard. Or this is something I always experience every week that I have to run against it. Um, where they're also definitely unappreciative is that I push. So they don't see this possibility of becoming a company that's seven times as big next year than we were last year as something that we should do, should be aiming for even. 
they say no why why do you always see growth as this in the as the end uh, end solution uh, or why, why do you always just try to keep making more money which is not the reason that we're trying to become quicker the reason that we need to be quicker is that we need to <coughs> do this in a key vendor thing so that's quite that, that you need to have a, a certain amount of <coughs> resilience <laughs> But would you apply this mindset to the German Mittelstand or more to a generation? Uh, very good question. It's definitely a generation thing. But then, of course, the Mittelstand mostly is run by not my generation, but the boomer generation. And the boomer generation is nearing, is nearing retirement and is not interested in changing a lot because they're 10 years, 5 to 10 years away from retirement. And the change is difficult and annoying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that definitely, definitely an age. I mean, the one way that I've been able to counter this is that the people that we hire are all twenty-five to thirty. Mm -hmm. in, in the people in the office, the people mm -hmm. that are electricians or craftsmen in general, I pronounce that we hire young people because it helps. It helps a lot to um, get acceptance for a change. It's a bit. Sad to see that, but it's probably also quite normal. May I ask what some people? Mm -hmm. That's true, I, I do have the same opinion about that, but on your pain points, there mm -hmm. was one thing um, going the extra mile. Yeah. And this is something, um, it's from my experience and talking to other entrepreneurs with the younger generation, it's not so easy because there are a lot of other things uh, they are more important for them, life work balance, etc. Cetera, et cetera. <coughs> How do you bring that together? I would, I would say that you bring it together by bringing together working smart with the work life balance. Because the more, I, in my experience, what the, there's this graph of basically the boomer generation <coughs> sees is, is, is living to work. Um, Whereas, I, and so I'm officially Generation Y, I think, uh, where we try to, to work and live, and then the Generation X is first first working and then li Yeah, well, it's, it, no, it's, it's first, I think it's called first, li first living, then working or something. So yes, they're definitely, there's definitely a change and younger people don't want to work uh, 80 hours a week, or not all of them. <laughs> um, I would say that, yes, working smart, so, the, the combination of willingness to use tools, to use software in order to get more done in the same amount of time allows you to get enough because we don't have to, we don't have to grow by every, by every mean. We don't. So in this for example, specific case, we don't have to start doing marketing and trying to become even bigger and bigger like a startup has to do that has external investors because we, because we don't have external investors. We don't have, we don't have the need to grow further than our demand allows us. Um, so if we can already reach the, just that demand, we will already have to be using a lot of software and then hopefully we get the work done that we need to get done in, in 40 hours per week per person. Hopefully. But as you're right, there's a lot of people that are, we get a lot of, especially in the office, a lot of people are asking if they could do... The work-life balance is also uh, um, a lack of resilience. Year over year, it's uh, especially now with, with Corona and all those things. It's kind of loose and small and it kept yeah. companies. We had really, really big problems with uh, not only hiring but with uh, yeah. productivity. Yeah, yeah that's it, it's. We we're not at the stage yet where we measure productivity uh, efficiently or effectively. Um, but I, I, so I can't really say so far how, how, how I would see that. Um, what I do see is a lot of people want a four-day work week. So a lot of people uh, ask if they could ha have Fridays off, which we're now thinking about doing is saying, well, you, we can say for the, uh, the work craftsman that Friday is going to, Friday is off on your own terms if your project is done by, by, by Thursday. So the projects typically start on, on Monday if they finish the projects by them, at the moment they finish them on, on Friday afternoon, if they finish them on Thursday, then they can, they, then, then we will pay them on Friday, but they don't have to come. Um, it's something that we've heard, seen at other companies and it seems to work quite well. Um, speaking about motivation, right? Speaking about how could you push, it's basically a bonus system. But that's actually, 
that's actually one of the main points that I haven't looked at yet or I, have, I haven't spent a lot of time on is could you imagine what's completely normal in consulting, completely normal in tech is bonus systems. Incentives for either, either annual bonuses, sales bonuses, some sort of bonuses. And in craftsmanship, it's not very normal. It's not normal to, and, and also they, there's a certain negativity around it because people think that they're going to be like a, a factory worker who's told, oh, you need to make 300 garments per day, which is also probably bad, uh, and you're paid per garment. But it's not that, but what, what could work is if you say, well, this is the base salary, and it's going to be the same that you've been making. We're not going to cut your salary. Um, but you could increase it if <coughs> you reach certain um, productivity goals. But it's a big discussion. Uh, I'm having this discussion back and forth. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That was super insightful. I was just wondering what a lot about our uh, experience from tech and mm -hmm. consulting can mm -hmm. improve small or size business in the Schwanz company. Mm -hmm. I was wondering is there maybe something you can take away from the Mittelstands company mm -hmm. and apply it to startups? Is there right. something maybe to make up? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it certainly goes vice versa. Um, and in a way, you're right because. So maybe this goes also to your question on, on what have what have I learned so far from it? What, what can I be appreciate but appreciative about? And you have to see that this company has been existing for 25 years. It has actually gone through two major crises, and it has survived those two major crises by being resilient. Um, so resilience, in a way, when you look at founders, often you, you see founders mm. maybe giving up quite quickly. Also, it's not often it's not their money. So if they give up, they actually don't lose anything. They lose a bit of their reputation. But then we, have, we are trying publicly to say fa failure culture is a good thing. If you fail, don't worry. You can do it again. Um, and actually, that's not an option for a Mittelstands company. This is quite interesting, actually. So this is something that I would say is a good value to learn from them is, yes, failing is OK, but maybe don't fail ultimately. You can fail small steps, and, and you can try and and reiterate, but you shouldn't fail ultimately with the company. You should still be able to turn a profit, because only if you turn a profit will the employees still have a job next day. Uh, and, and this is something that you can definitely learn, which is also looking a lot more on the cost side, uh, looking always on the cost side, not just in a downturn like we experience at the moment, where a lot of startups are cutting jobs, but also in an upturn. You still say, well, we're not going to go crazy. We're not going to have a 20,000 euro dinner party just because we could. <laughs> and. Um, this is a certain way of humbleness, maybe. So maybe I think as, um, SM, SMBs or SMB f um, leaders are often a lot more humble. And in a way, they don't really talk a lot about what they do. Um, whereas in the startup world, we have a lot of conferences and we speak all the time about what we're doing. Um, but it's not as, it's, it's, it's really not important in their world. And it's also quite nice that they just, do their, their work, and often, their, I mean, their work is typically, they're quite social. So I can see already that, in, uh, for example, in our company, we're paying a lot more to employees on, uh, per, on an hourly basis as larger companies. Um, definitely, there's an aspect of Kamu's or Mittelstands mm -hmm. companies being a lot more social with their employees, making sure that their employees are well, um, maybe making sure that they don't overwork themselves, that there's enough processes, the processes are the right ones so that they can um, have the time off and so on. Um, that they might, for example, one big thing is that I, this is something I've read, but I, apparently Mittelstands companies are a major, major um, funding source for local community activities. So churches, sport, sporting clubs, um, and so on, or initiatives for to protect the local pond or something. Um, this is something that startups typically don't do, consulting companies definitely don't do it, um, or, and also bigger companies in general probably don't do it, or they do it, but on a, on a big scale that's so removed from, mm. um, from the, the local impact. So the local impact of Kamu of Kam companies seems, seems to be quite, quite important. So this is something I think you could probably learn. Do we have a last question before we go to the networking? I have one more uh, question. Mm -hmm. um, you uh, talked about the, the difficult and painful process um, when people start thinking about 
wanting to have mm -hmm. uh, a system. A system, yeah. And could you imagine to apply artificial int intelligence to that? So, for example, a, a, a nice app, you know, where people just start. <coughs> Essentially, that's what's being done. I mean, so if you go on the website of, it's not really artificial intelligence because it's not such a difficult, it's not as difficult as a process. Um, but it's time. It takes time and you have to automate it, of course. I know that if, we could, for example, so if we had more, or if we had programmers at all, uh, we could probably build uh, a tool where you can type your address and then Google Maps will show your house. Uh, but effectively today you can still not, it's very hard to teach an AI to decide whether a, ho a, a, a roof is interesting or not, or is feasible or not. But that would be possible, it would definitely, it would definitely be possible. Um, but then you have, a, that's a major, that's a major uh, NLP um, or that's a major uh, AI uh, project, right? And yeah, as we're not in building AI, but we're in building solar systems. Yeah, know, yeah, yeah but you're right. Yeah. So if, if I had the resources, that could be interesting, yeah. yeah. And uh, maybe to that one, there exists some in like um, mostly English speaking ones where it's like plans, uh, sure. like um, does it automatically. But the thing is, like for your case, probably in general, like it doesn't, matter you have to you can like automate it automatize it a little bit as Nico say and you you don't want to do it yourself or build it yourself because yeah it's a company on, on its own so yeah. you it's way, it would be way too Aurora for example Aurora, yeah, it would be yes. way way too expensive to, to do it as a small SMB. So Aurora is an American company that has basically run these models. Uh, it would cost us I think more than a hundred euros per house to run the system. Um, is we don't want to pay those costs because we have enough people that want a system without without that. Uh, we're not going to start paying it. Uh, if customers would want to do that because they want to have, um, they want to see whether their roof is feasible, there's actually even a public, there's a public source for this and there's a so-called Zolar Kataster that some of, I know in, in, in Schleswig-Holstein, three or four of the communities of the Gemeinden um, started to do this. So basically that's the same thing actually. It's like I can, I can send you the link and you can maybe, I don't know, share it somehow. Um, I don't know if this exists for Berlin, for example. Um, basically, you ha it's actually exactly that. It's, it tells you if your roof is feasible, from, but mostly from a directional perspective, so from a, from a 360 degree perspective. It, it, but mostly tells you, is your roof south, west or east? Um, you should probably <laughs> be able to do that without, a, without AI. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, Maria, it was for super, me. super interesting. We learned a lot. Um, yeah. Thank you. Great, great career choice. And uh, yeah, we still can network a bit. I, I have one question for you. Does it, has anybody actually tried to buy a solar system? Or are you all, ah, okay. Yeah. And how was that experience? We, we have one on our house right now oh. and we are waiting for the inverter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, August. Okay. But um, yeah, we are hopeful <laughs> to get it for Christmas. Yeah, what? <laughs> <laughs> Christmas tree. Yeah, nice yeah. present. Yeah. Okay. That's crazy. That's crazy.